that's a special day. We still celebrate Jesus every day, but we celebrate him on, you know, 25th of December. We want to, it's an opportunity for the whole world to hear about Christ. I know some people have hang-ups about Christmas and all that, and yeah, it's not of God, and da-da-da-da-da, and how do you know he was really born that day? It doesn't matter. Amen. If you want to fight something, fight Halloween. Come on. That's one day of the year where people, whether they like it or not, get to hear about Jesus. I mean, you drive up the main street of Toowoomba City Council, they've got a nativity scene there. Everybody gets to see it. Believe it or not, whether they're, faith, they're Christian or not, atheist, it doesn't matter. They, that, it's right in front of them. Nobody can say that they were never, they, it was never witnessed to them. So, bless God. It's an opportunity to say, you know, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to die for us. And um, I think it's, an, it's always a blessing. Well, without much further ado, this family is a, such a precious family. Uh, the great exchange happened. God sent me here and God sent them he, from here to there, back to where I came from, <laughs> back in Africa. And, uh, and, and it's wonderful because sometimes a prophet is with, without honor in his own country. So sometimes God will lift you up and send you somewhere else and you'll find that you'll have a voice in another place that you may not necessarily have where you came from. How I many of you know that's true? And, um, and so, you know, I thank God for them because, you know, I've got it better than them. I came from difficulty to a good place. They have left a good place to a difficult place. They have, in other words, they have to really believe God for every day. Just clean water is an issue. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, just to be able to trust even the water you make coffee with is a, is a, we gotta pray for there to be a miracle. There's mosquitoes, there's malaria. So we need to cover our missionaries and, and pray for them as they go back into, uh, Mozambique to go and do some ministry. And there's a big work that have already just begun there. They were telling me about it. They're gonna probably share a little bit about that. But let's just, uh, receive this morning, uh, this wonderful woman of God, Rosalind Fields. Ashley Fields, the husband as well. So we honor both of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Jimmy. Jimmy, Apostle Jimmy, I should say. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> My beautiful husband, Ashley. We've got our son, Jordan, with us today. He is actually called by the Lord to Egypt. He's going there one day. So when you were saying Egypt, I'm like, yes, amen for Jordan. <laughs> and my mother is here with us today as well, Mama Inika. She is my intercessor. When you were talking about prayer, she has prayed for me in the most trying circumstances. One time we were in central Mozambique, we were traveling through and there was a war happening there at the time. And we drove with a military convoy through the war zone and we were attacked on the road and we were in the middle of a gun battle for about 40 minutes with bullets flying all around us and the ground exploding. And I thought, I'll send a text to my mother <laughs> because she's my intercessor, my poor, my poor mom. And uh, we, I had no phone reception. We were in the bush. And so I thought, I'm just going to text her anyway. I texted her, pray for us. We're getting shot at. This is my, what my mother has to put up with <laughs> having me as a daughter. You know, she just gets this text. I'm getting shot at. Pray. And uh, I had no phone reception, and one minute later, I get a text back from her saying, I'm praying right now, and I still had no phone reception. My phone is just, bing, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. And her prayers really worked. We were surrounded by angels. At one point, Ash thought, I'll take my family and we'll go in the storm drain. There was a big storm drain right next to the car. We were in a truck. I was in the tray in the back of the truck with my children getting shot at and uh, Ash is thinking oh we'll go and we'll hide in the storm drain and the Lord said to him do not move and two minutes later a grenade hit that storm drain and blew it up and so if we had gone in there we would be dead right now so it pays to listen to the voice of God man has plans you know, we make plans, but the end thereof is death. <laughs> you know, we think it's a good idea. 
but it's a better idea to listen to the Lord and to do what God says. Prayer is so important. Actually, uh, that story you shared about when the Lord put on your heart to pray for your parents, we were in South Africa and Jordan was, how old were you, like nine or 10, maybe 10 or 11 years old. And we were in this little apartment. It was this tiny little flat and I could not find Jordan anywhere. And Ash, my husband, he was away driving with our Mozambican son to go pick up a trailer about two hours away. So he was gone, and I couldn't find Jordan. And my other children and I were searching everywhere. And it's a tiny little flat. There's just two rooms. I'm like, where's Jordan? And we're crying out, Jordan, Jordan, where's Jordan? And we're looking everywhere. We couldn't find him anywhere. And I went back into the living room, and I'm just, where is Jordan? And he walks out of the bedroom with a big smile on his face. I said, where were you? He said, I've been in the room. I said, no, you weren't. We were in there looking everywhere for you. He said, mom, I was in the room. I said, what were you doing? He said, I was praying. I said, what What were you praying about? He said, I was praying for dad. God told me to pray for dad. About an hour later, Ash comes walking in the house with my Mozambican son, and they're both, their faces are white. <laughs> and my, Moz- my African son is white. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like this. They walk in the room. I said, what happened? They were driving down the highway doing 120, <laughs> like you do in Africa. And they had the trailer on the back of the car, and they're driving down the highway, and a big truck came out of a side street right in front of them, just right in front of them. Ash shut his eyes and he just went, Jesus, like this. And when he opened his eyes, they were on the other side of the truck. God picked up that car and put it and saved their lives. And Jordan was there praying. God made him invisible so I wouldn't interrupt his prayer. (laughs) I had no idea what was happening, but God knows what is happening. And God is good. And I'm here to tell you today that God is good and that God has done everything that you need. It is finished. Everything that you need in your life. Jesus has already paid for it on the cross. And all we need to do is know Jesus. That's all we need to do. We spend so much time trying to figure everything out and make plans and do things and and fix our problems and how am I going to do it? How am I going to fix things? And all we need to do is know Jesus. That's all we need to do because Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer to your problems. Jesus is the one who will meet you in the hospital like he did with Ralph. Jesus will do it because Jesus has already done it on the cross 2,000 years ago. He said, it is finished. It was the last thing that came out of his mouth before he gave up his life for us. It is finished finished. And when we were in worship today, he said to me, tell them it is finished. Tell them what I have done for them. Tell them what I have done. See here my hands. See my nail pierced hands. See my feet. Look at my feet. Look at the hole in my feet in my hands. Look at the scars on my back. Look at the crown of thorns. Look what I have done for you. It is finished. Stop looking at your problems and start looking at Jesus because Jesus is your answer. There are some of you here, God told me this morning, there are some people in here and there are things that you have been striving for years for in prayer and, and things like sickness in a family or, or issues in your life, issues in your family that you have been contending and worrying over for years. And God says, it is finished. I am your answer. Do not look to the left or the right. Do not look to your problems. Do not look anymore at your issues, but look to Jesus. Look to Jesus and make it your life's goal to know him. Just to know God. That is my purpose in this life is to know God. 
And I have ministry. I have over 40 churches that we oversee. We have so much things going on everywhere. We have things happening in the north of Australia, in Mozambique, in South Africa, everywhere. And my life is not that. My life is Jesus. I just want to know him. I want to know God. That's my life. That was Paul's mission. Oh, that I may know him. I count everything else but dung, but filth, but for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Because when you know God, nothing is impossible. When you know who God is, you can walk through this life with surety, with faith, with confidence, because your confidence rests in him and your hope rests in him because you know him. I know God. And so therefore nothing is impossible for me. I know God. And so therefore I can go into a war zone without fear because God has me in the palm of his hand and who can stand against me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper because I know my God and my God is good. The problem is people don't know God. We don't know God. We come to church on Sunday. We talk about Jesus and then we go and have lunch and we get on with our life. But we don't know him. We know about him. We know about God, we know about Jesus, we know his name, but we don't know him, intimately know him. I know my God. I know how good he is. His number one attribute, his goodness. Surely his goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I know my God. I know his goodness. I know his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, his steadfastness, his love, his power, his mighty working power, his dunamis. I know him and therefore I am fearless. <laughs> I have showdowns with witch doctors all the time. I love it. I get so excited. I tell you, my Mozambican team, they're always like, oh, Mama Rosa. We go to villages to do outreaches. And we go to some serious places, and I'm always on the lookout for witch doctors. I, I'm, I'm listening. You know, I hear my pastors talking about a certain village, and did you hear about the witch doctor in this village? And, oh, it's terrible. Did you hear what he did? 20 people. He killed 20 people. Oh, this witch doctor ate somebody the other day. And I'm listening while they're talking, and I'm like, really? Really? Where is it? Where, what's the name of this village? And they look at me, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> Why did we talk about this in front of Mama Rosa? I'm like, let's go. Let's go to the village. Let's go. Where, where, where is it? Where is this village? Let's go. Because I know my God. <laughs> and that witch doctor is all powerful and full of pride. And he's got the whole world. And he's, he thinks he's superior to everybody. And then I come into his village little me. Hi. <laughs> Let's play. <laughs> because it's not me. It's God who walks with me. God who sends me. God who is with me because I'm his little girl. I'm just his little girl. That's all I am. I'm his daughter. You mess with me, you mess with my father. <laughs> and I know my God. And so we go into these villages and miracles start to happen because the witch doctor wants to be in control. And so he tries to do a... And I'm there like, Come on, Jesus. <laughs> We went to this one village, and they told me he ate people. This witch doctor was a cannibal. He ate people to get more power. <laughs> Help him, Jesus. And uh, so we pull up into this village, and I ask the chief. We go, first thing we do, we always go visit with the chief of the village and introduce ourselves. Hello, how are you? I ask the chief, where does the witch doctor live? I want to set up my tent next door. <laughs> 
<laughs> the chief is like, you're crazy. You're going to die. Like he kills people with magic, with his dark power. He kills people, literally kills people. I'm like, great, let's go. <laughs> so he shows me, he's like, he lives there. So I set up our tents next door. And I said, we're going to do our outreach outside the front of his house. <laughs> we're going to set up our sound system right here. And uh, the chief, he said, well, tonight can you go in the soccer field and then tomorrow night you can go in front of the witch doctor's house. So I said, okay, we'll do that. So the first night we're in the soccer field and everybody's there. There's a big multitude of people and we're preaching the gospel and it's amazing and wonderful. And everyone's giving their heart to Jesus. And then God speaks to me and he says, there's a deaf person here. And uh, so I'm, I start yelling out, where's the deaf person? Where's the deaf person? Ash is like, she can't hear you because she's deaf. <laughs> If you know the deaf person, bring them to me. So I get up on a chair because there's just crowds everywhere. Deaf person, Jesus told me there's a deaf person. Where is she? And 10 minutes or so. And then finally this lady brings her old mother with her. And she's deaf and mute. She can't, she can't hear, she can't speak. And so I put my fingers in her ears and I say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And instantly her hearing opens up. Like, like this. This happens. It, I tell you, the bigger the witch doctor, the easier it is to work miracles. I don't know why it is. It's just, and everybody else is scared. Oh, you won't be able to do anything because the witch doctor's there. I'm like, no, no, no. We do the opposite. We do more when the witch doctor's there. Because we're demonstrating the glory of God. And Jesus is there to show off. <laughs> And so her ears open immediately. Her daughter is standing behind her calling her and she's immediately looking and she can hear. And she starts laughing, but she still couldn't talk. And I'm trying to get her to talk and say, Jesus, Jesus. And she's like, oh, just couldn't talk. And then the daughter was like, we have to go. And so I said, okay, bring her in the morning. She's going to have breakfast with us and she's going to speak. And so... We finish up preaching and praying for people, amazing miracles. The next morning, I wake up. It's like 5 o'clock in the morning. We went to sleep at 1 or 2 in the morning after praying for everybody. And then you've got the chickens making noise at, at 3. Like, they're supposed to make a noise when the sun comes up. They don't. They make a noise a long time before the sun comes up. <laughs> I don't know, there's something wrong with it. I just, shut up, <laughs> I'm sleeping. <laughs> and then the mamas start uh, sweeping the floor, like five o'clock. Like, shh, I want to sleep. So, so I wake, I get up, I come out of my tent, and it's five o'clock in the morning, and that mama's standing right there waiting like this. I'm like, oh, hello, good morning. And she opens her mouth and she just begins to talk. Blah, 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 blah. Non-stop. She followed me all day talking. <laughs> I'm like, can you stop? <laughs> just stop talking. <laughs> and so we gave her some breakfast. She starts to eat breakfast. And then her daughter gets really upset because it was Ramadan, which is the Muslim time of fasting. And they're Muslims. And her mom is now eating during fasting. And she says, stop eating. It's Ramadan. And the mama turns to her and goes, I'm a Christian now. I can do what I want. <laughs> So <laughs> then we have this boy comes to our camp and he says, can you please come and pray for my mom? She's on the other side of the village in her bed. She cannot walk. She can't get up. She couldn't come last night for prayer. Can you come and pray for her? She's very sick. So he said, of course. So we walked over to, to her place about 20 minutes away. And she is lying in this rope bed, very sick, just uh, like this. And we heard that she hadn't walked in three years. She was very sick. They had to carry her to the bathroom. They had spent all they had on the witch doctor to heal her. I mean, those witch doctors are thieves. They, they steal everything from these people and they keep them sick so they can get more and more and more. So they are the poorest of the poor because everything has gone to the witch doctor. And we come freely 
in the name of Jesus. Freely you have received, freely give. And we knelt around her bed and we begin to worship and praise God. And we're just singing worship songs. And I look at her and God says to me, ask her if she wants to sit up. So I said to her, do you want to sit up? And she said, yes. So I helped her sit up. And she sat on the edge of her bed for the first time in three years. She's just sitting there. I said, how do you feel? And she said, I feel very hot. It's like fire. <laughs> I said, yes, it is. It's the fire of God. And so we prayed some more. And then I said, do you want to stand up? And she said, yes. So I helped her to stand up. And she's standing very wobbly like this. Just, And I'm holding on to her. And I said, you want to walk? And she's like, yes. So we start walking and we do the, you know, when you're, you're wanting a miracle and you're sort of dragging someone who can't walk. <laughs> Come on, let's walk. Look, they're walking. They're walking. Well, it was a little bit like that. And so she's just leaning on me and I'm, I'm helping her walk. And then suddenly she stops and she just begins to vomit all this green, horrible stuff. And she's just vomiting and vomiting and vomiting up. And we're praying over her. And when she finishes vomiting, she just stands up straight like this. She shakes me off and she starts running around her yard. <sighs> For free, because Jesus loves her. And I told her that Jesus loves you. Jesus did this. He is the one with all the power, all the authority, all the might and all the glory belongs to him. I said, will you come tomorrow in, in the morning and testify at our campsite? We're going to have our first ever church service outside the witch doctor's house tomorrow morning. Can you come and testify? She said, yes. And so the next morning we had our sound system blaring. We're worshiping right outside the witch doctor's house. I could see him. He had a bamboo fence and he's like glaring at us through the fence. <laughs> And we're praising the name of God. We're glorifying his name. And along comes this woman walking all by herself, 20 minutes through the village. She hasn't walked in three years. Everybody is watching her. They all know her. They all know the witch doctor has not been able to heal her. And she comes walking up, grabs the microphone. I have been healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. What the witch doctor could not do, Jesus did for free. <laughs> <gasps> Hallelujah. This is our God. He is good. He is faithful. He is mighty. He is for you. He is with you. And when you know God, you do exploits. Hallelujah. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32. And this is actually in context, it's talking about the end times, about when the, the um, abomination of desolation is set up and all the persecution, everything. This is the end times talking about. And it's when he says in Daniel 11:32, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Hallelujah. And I used to read this scripture. I found this scripture when I was very young in the Lord, and I was so excited. I'm going to do exploits, exploits everywhere, exploits. And my whole focus was on the exploits, because then it would prove that I know God. And God tipped it around, and he said, no, your focus needs to be on knowing me. When you know me, exploits just happen by accident. <laughs> you're just walking around doing life and knowing God and spending your life knowing God. And you're walking through this life knowing him. And then whoop, there's an exploit. Oh, there's another exploit. Oh, dearie me, I just exploited. <laughs> that's, that's just what happens. And we just doing life and oh no, there's another exploit. It's a consequence of knowing God. It's a natural outworking of knowing your God. When you know God, you are strong and you do exploits. It's just the way of it. And the reason we don't see many exploits these days is because not many people know him. So many people sitting in churches have never had an encounter with God. They don't know God. 
They've been asked to say a prayer of salvation. They've been told a gospel message. You know, come to Jesus, say this prayer, and your life will be better, and you'll be blessed. I don't see that in my Bible. <laughs> it's not the gospel that I read. Rejoice when you enter into persecution. That's in my Bible. <laughs> we, the apostles, are the least of all, the lowest of all. We die so that others might live. That's the gospel. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. That's the gospel. And people don't know him. People have come to church and said a prayer, but they've never met God. And God sent me here today to ask you, do you know God? Do you know him? Have you met him? Do you know the God who died on Calvary? Do you know the Christ of the cross? Do you know Jesus, the resurrected King? Do you know God Almighty? Do you know him? Do you know your God? Because today is the day that God wants you to know him. And maybe you've said a prayer and maybe you've been coming to church for years, but you do not know your God. God says, that's not enough. I don't want you to know about me. I want you to know me. My sheep know me. They know my voice. They are known by me. I know them and they know me. Jesus said in the last day, people will say, I did this, I did that, I did this. And he said, I, I never knew you. Moses, when he was, he had seen so many miracles already seen so many miracles, all the plagues and the, the sea parting before him and all these incredible miracles. And then he went up the mountain and there's fire on the mountain and he cries out to God and he says, show me your glory. He wanted to know God. And you think, but surely Moses knew God. I mean, he saw all these miracles, but his heart's cry wasn't the miracles and leading people. He didn't want to lead all those people. He wanted to know God. In that prayer, he said, teach me now your way so that I may know you. Teach me your way so that I may know you. That was all Moses wanted. Show me your glory. Teach me your ways. I want to know you. If I have found favor in your sight, let your presence be here with us. And do not lead me up from this place unless your presence goes with me. He wanted to know God. And because he knew God, the great I am exploits happened everywhere. Miracle after miracle after miracle because Moses knew God. Paul, in every epistle, you can find his, he's written somewhere in there, I just want to know God. In Corinthians, he said, I am determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him glorified and him crucified. In Philippians, he said, oh, that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings, and the power of his resurrection, that I be made conformable unto his death, <laughs> that I may know him. He wants us to know him. That is the number one thing God wants from us, is that we would just know him. That's why he created us. He wanted a family. He didn't want workers in a factory doing a job and then clocking off at the end of the day and going home and leaving him behind. He didn't want that. Christianity is not a job. It's not a hobby. It's not a social club. It's not something we do after hours. It's not a side gig that we have. Christianity is our life. Because Jesus died to give us new life. He raised us up from death into the newness of life. He breathed his breath into our souls. He resurrected us from the death of sin that we were in. And the bondage and the slavery that we were under. And he gave us a brand new life. Why? So that we can go to church for two hours? <sighs> Did he hang on that cross for eight hours so that we could go to church for two hours on a Sunday? 
If I say it with a smile, it's nicer. <laughs> he loves you so much. But he does. That's why he died. Because he loves you. He just wants to be with you. He loves you so desperately that he died so that you could be brought back into relationship with him. He died for you to be allowed back into the presence of God. He died so that you could know God. He didn't die so that you could go to church. He didn't die so that you could have a social club. He didn't die so that you could live your own life and then speak to him whenever you have a problem and never talk to him again. That is not why he died. He died because he loves you. He demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He just wants to know you. <laughs> he wants to be known by you. He wants a people who will seek him with all their heart because we, he's precious to us. When something is precious to you, you search it out. That's why Jesus gave that parable of the, the person who lost their coin. You know, oh no, where's my money? My, it's treasure. I've got to find it. I look all over the house. You turn the house upside down because you're searching for this precious coin. Is Jesus not more precious to us than that? Then we must search him out because we want to know him. Teach me now your ways so that I may know you, God. And the point, the motive of knowing him is not so that we can have a ministry. It's not so that we can be blessed. It's not so that he can give us stuff and take care of our problems. Our knowing him is just because he's altogether worthy. And we want to know him. And then when you know him, exploits happen. You can't help it because he's incredible. God is magnificent and glorious and his power is, is unstoppable, never ending. His power is incredible. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing, nothing is impossible. And he wants to show himself through us. The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro across the face of the earth. In Chronicles it says, searching for those whose hearts are fully his, through whom he can show himself strong. He wants hearts that are his. The first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the number one priority for God. That's why he made it the first commandment. That is the number one thing that God wants us to be working on, to love him. I mean, wow, how easy. <laughs> he could have chosen anything. Number one commandment, I want you to go out and to build churches and... Uh, he said, no, number one, just would you love me, <laughs> please, with all your heart? Not with a piece of your heart, but with all your heart. Would you just love me? And when we do that, exploits. And then other people get to know God because they see God through you. One of my favorite verses, I think it's in Galatians, where Paul said, and they glorified God through me. It's it basically, they looked at Paul and they began to glorify God. I want that. I want people to look at me and forget me and just begin to glorify God because of what they see him doing through my life, because I know him and I'm just living for him and exploits are happening and people are seeing and going, glory to God. That's what I want for my life. That's all I want. I want to know him and I want to make him known. I want him to, to show himself strong through me, through my little life. I only get a few years on this planet. I want to shine as bright as I can for those few years before I get to go home and be with him forever. Because I honestly would rather just go home and be with him. <laughs> this earth is horrible. 
I want to be with Jesus. I want to go for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. It's wonderful. I want to go be with Jesus. But I'm here. I'm stuck down here in this sinful place. So I'm going to make the most of it. And I'm going to shine with all the glory of God. And the way to do that is by knowing him. And then I walk into a village and the demons tremble. Literally. I went to one village and they told me, again, they're always trying to warn me. <laughs> so funny. Why would you try to warn me? They try to warn me. Oh, but this village is really scary. They're like the regional witch doctors here. He's like oversees the other witch doctors. He's like the apostle of witch doctors, you know. He has little witch doctors under him that he trains. They're like, this guy is serious. I'm like, yeah let's go get him and and they said no you don't understand there have been other Christian groups that have tried to go into this village and the witch doctor has stopped them every time they cannot preach the gospel there they go there and their sound system blows up or they 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 run out of gas in their car before they get there or you know, every time something has happened and they cannot preach the gospel there I said let's go <laughs> they're like you're not listening I'm like no I'm listening to him not you <laughs> you can speak words of doubt but I listen to this nothing is impossible Jesus you make the darkness tremble I'm like come on let's go let's go make the darkness tremble so we show up in this village and I'm expecting, you know, showdown. I'm like, yeah, Rabbi Shokoro, Elijah with the prophets of Baal. I'm like, like, bring it on. Let's go. Let's call down fire out of heaven. And we're there all weekend preaching the gospel. No problems. I don't, I don't even see the witch doctor. We're just preaching, praying for the sick. A whole family got delivered of demons. This little boy, nine-year-old boy who hadn't slept ever in his life nine years every night tormented by demons every night just screaming in his sleep had never slept in nine years and his mom brought him to me and I asked this little boy I said do you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart when Jesus owns you those demons can't touch you do you want to give your life to Jesus he's like yes so I led him to the Lord just said a simple blessing over him he went home and slept all night <laughs> The next day, his family, all his family came with all their sick, and they all got healed. We, it was so easy. It was like the easiest. I'm thinking, everybody told me we wouldn't be able to do anything here. This is easy. So people getting healed, I don't even have to pray for them. I'm just, bless you, bless you. And people, like, it's just miracle. It's not me. It's God. It's just so easy. This atmosphere is glorious. And so at the end of the weekend, I asked the chief of the village, where's the witch doctor? I was told he was very scary and we wouldn't be able to do anything here. Is he even here? And the chief said, oh, yeah, he's here. He's been here all weekend. I said, well, where? I mean, I haven't even had a little demon try to, you know, give me a headache. It's been so easy. <laughs> and he goes, he's been stuck inside his house all weekend. And now he lives in a mud hut. It's not like it's hard to get out of that mud hut with the little rickety door. He was stuck inside. He literally could not leave his house all weekend. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, the scary witch doctor. Ooh, I'm so scared. <laughs> He's trying to get out of his house. <laughs> I'm just having fun, you know. Hallelujah. <laughs> I had no idea because exploits are just happening because I know my God. I know God. I know when I walk into a village, he's coming with me. These signs follow those who believe. We're just going and the, he, God is with us and things are happening because God is with us because I know him. And people ask me, don't you get afraid? What about fear? I had someone just ask me, Two nights ago, he's like, I always get afraid when I want to preach the gospel. How did you overcome your fear? You know, was there ever a, a certain moment in your life where the fear left you? And I said, yes, on the day that I got saved, <laughs> I had an encounter with the love of Christ. The love of God came in the room like a tangible 
power, his love came and overwhelmed me and set me free and made me born again. And perfect love casts out fear. I'm not afraid because I know God and I know he loves me. And when you know that someone loves you, you know they've got your back. My husband loves me. I know he protects me. He takes care of me. I'm not worried about that because I know him. He, I can trust him. He's got my back. God has got my back. Even when I do stupid things. <laughs> it's the grace of God. <laughs> and I do stupid things a lot. <laughs> And I make lots of mistakes because I don't know what I'm doing. People are always like, oh, it's Roz. Roz is the amazing woman of faith. Roz does these things. I'm like, no, you have no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I make mistakes every day. I do stupid things every day. But Jesus is with me, and his blood is continuously washing me clean, and his spirit is within me, and he loves me, and I love him. And because my heart is only to please him, my heart is pure before him. He covers everything else, thank God. Love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> God is a good, good God. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to really, really know him. When, when what was your name, sorry? Ralph. Ralph, yeah. When you were sharing your testimony, it reminded me of this time in Mozambique. My Mozambican son came to me crying. He said his grandma is dying. And he just got a phone call from the family in the village that she was on death's door and he needs to come right now and say goodbye. So we got in the car and we drove about an hour to the village. And we got there and her whole family is sitting outside the hut. And they're all Muslim, big Muslim family, all with their hats and their, you know. The <laughs> and we walk in there and she's lying in her bed and she was making that rattling noise, that death rattle and her, she just couldn't even open her eyes she was about to die and I looked at her and I thought she's gonna die like this is a woman of faith here right oh no she's gonna die and uh, I looked at Johnny my son I said let's just pray for her so we prayed for her for about 20 minutes. We're praying, God, in Jesus' name, heal her. Right now, we, we commend healing. and We're praying, but my heart wasn't in it. I was just, I thought, she's going to die. That's all I was thinking. I had no faith. Just, she's going to die. And so we prayed. And then after a while, we got up and left, and we said goodbye to the family outside. We drove back home. And then when we get home, we get a phone call from the family. And they said, what did you do to her when you walked in that house? <laughs> this Muslim man, and what did you do? And Johnny says, we just prayed to Jesus. And he said, right after you left, about five minutes after you left, we're all sitting outside and she comes walking out the door and she says, I'm hungry. And she goes and starts to cook for everybody. <laughs> Jesus, he does this. He just, you see, I had nothing to do with that. I just, I love God. I know God. I'm just doing life with God. I was in a moment. I don't know why. I just looked at her. She looked dead. Like she was, it was impossible. This is hopeless. She's like, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> And I leave, and she just, she just walked. I saw her six months later. I did not recognize her. She looked young. She looked healthy. Johnny was like, Mama, this was the my grandma that we prayed for. I said, no, it wasn't. This is another lady. He goes, no, this is my grandma that we prayed for. I said, what? <laughs> That's incredible. God is good. God is so good. I'll share a couple more stories. So we were just in Africa a few months ago, and our region that we oversee is at the moment in a war zone, and there's Al-Shabaab terrorists there, uh, and they have overtaken the north of Mozambique. And we have had a lot of persecution. We were there when the war started. We were there. The Al-Shabaab came to kill us in our house, and there were angels standing at our gate. And actually, our neighbors saw them come with their machetes and their guns, and they had their 
scarves all wrapped around their heads and jihad written on their their scarves and they were congregating around our house because I used to preach the gospel to them. I knew them. We knew the neighborhood. And I was just talking to my pastor when I was there a couple of months ago and he was telling me, he's like, remember when we used to go together to the Al-Shabaab neighborhood to preach to them? I said, yeah, and we were laughing, you know. He said, mommy, you know, I never told you this, but we went there like a few days before the war started. And we were going house to house and preaching to Al-Shabaab. And they told my pastor in their local tribal language, that day they told him, you're going to see what's about to happen in a few days. All your people are going to die. And he told my pastor that a few days before. And then the war started and they came to our house to kill us. And we had a few of them standing outside our gate and our neighbor saw them. And he said to us later, it was the strangest thing because they were standing in a circle talking and getting ready to go in your house. And he said, all of a sudden, they all just got these confused looks on their faces and they're just all and they're looking around and they all just sort of wandered off in different directions. <laughs> Spirit of confusion, same as with Elijah, you know, when the army came against them. He is God. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. So we were there for three days while they were shooting all around us, and we, we were in that war there, and we got out. But it's ongoing now. It's been going since 2017. A lot of people have been killed, a lot of atrocities. The things that you're hearing in Israel right now have been happening for years in the north of Mozambique. Babies, like all that kind of stuff. And we have been hearing it for years. So we were just in Mozambique, and I was talking to some of our pastors who've come out. They're now living a bit further south. And one of my mamas, she... I was sitting talking to her, and she's with a big smile on her face. She loves Jesus so much. And she's telling me her three uncles, her brother, her a uh, couple of her nephews, her sister were all killed by Al-Shabaab, beheaded. Her other sister was kidnapped by them, and they took her to their camp and kept her for three years chained up for three years and she just managed to escape recently. And I asked her, what did they do to her in those three years? And she said, she suffered. That's all she said to me. My pastors were telling me about just bodies everywhere. Our church is burnt, just horrific, but they're smiling. And I asked one of my pastors, he's also lost family members. His house was burned down, all his belongings. His little children, they walked for three days through the bush to escape with nothing but the clothes on their back, no food for three days. The children strapped to their backs running through the bush. Another mama I spoke to, she had blisters all down her legs because they walked for a week through the bush to escape. Not, not on the road, but through the bush with no food, with children, little children, no food, nothing. My mama, she said, they dug up some cassava roots in the bush. They found some cassava plants they hadn't eaten in a couple of days, and they dug up these roots to eat. You can eat them raw. I've eaten it raw. Have you eaten cassava raw? <laughs> it's not very nice. It's better when you fry it. <laughs> but they had... They had just started to dig up. Their children are crying. I'm hungry, mama, hungry, mama. And they dug up these roots. And then the Al-Shabaab came. They heard them coming. And they had to leave it behind and run again. Still didn't get to eat. Atrocities. And they're telling me. I was sitting with them crying. And they're telling me. And they're, they're smiling. And I said to my pastor, how do you do it? And he's like, how are you still praising God? How are you still so thankful and joyful right now? And he looked at me and he said, Mama, I praise God for the fire because gold isn't tried until it goes through the fire. And I just, I'm just staring at him. I said, I wish I could bring you to Australia and just put a microphone in your hand. They need to hear this in the church. They have suffered but they know God. They don't just know about him. They know Jesus, their savior. They know their king. They said to me, mama, they can take everything away from us, but they can't take Jesus out of our hearts. They went back to Masimba, to the village that we were living in, 
and uh, my mama, she was telling me they went and they found our two churches were still standing. Every other church had been destroyed in the village, but our two churches were the only ones still standing. She went in there with a few of the mamas to clean one of the churches so they could begin to worship there again. And she found a bomb in the rafters above the altar. And so they ran and got the military because the military is there now securing our village. And the soldiers came in and they looked at that bomb and the soldiers said this themselves. They proclaimed, they said, surely this is the house of God because that bomb should have gone off and it should have decimated this whole neighborhood. And it's just sitting there in the rafters. And he said, this is the house of God. <laughs> This is your God. He is your God. This God who protects us through war, who saves, who heals, who delivers, who sets free. He is watching over you. He loves you with a desperate love. He has given himself for you so that you may know him. Make it your life's work to know him. Make it your life's mission to seek after him and to know him with all your heart. God said to us, seek my face. My heart says your face, Lord, I will seek. Does your heart say the same? This world gets too busy. There's too many things going on, too many voices, too many distractions happening all the time, everywhere. Even ministry can be a distraction. Everything can distract you. But the one thing, is Jesus. The one thing is Jesus. And I want to finish on this um, verse. You know, Paul, he said it too. He said, I've become all things to all men. I'm preaching the gospel so that everybody can come to know this glorious gospel and be saved. But at the end of the day, I bring my own flesh under subjection as well so that I can also make it at the end. Because he is the one thing. Jesus is the one thing. In Hebrews chapter 12 and starting at verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, all of them that have gone before us are there watching now, and it's our turn. He says, Let us lay aside every weight, every distraction, and the sin which so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, you were his joy, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You were his joy as he hung up on that cross. And now he asks us, just look to me. I know your problems. I know your pain. I know what you're going through. I know what's happening in your life. I'm asking you to look to me. Just look to me. You don't have to keep reminding God of all the problems. <laughs> You don't have to keep, but what about this? What about this? What about, oh, but God, this is happening. Oh, God, what this is. God told me this morning there are people in here and you've been struggling. There's certain things you've been struggling for years with. And God is saying, today it's finished. You don't have to look to those things anymore. What about, what, uh, just look to Jesus. He is your answer. He is your everything. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. It does. It just fades away. When you're looking at Jesus, nothing else matters. When you're looking at Jesus, everything else fades away. You forget your problems and then your problems suddenly are resolved and you don't even know how it happened. <laughs> Because you're not looking at your problems anymore. You're not trying to fix them. You're just looking to Jesus. And then you suddenly realize, oh, oh, that problem that I have for years, I just forgot all about it. It's gone. Where did it go? I don't know. Jesus just took care of it because I was looking at Jesus. 
And God sent me here this morning just to remind you, it's so simple, just so simple. Only Jesus, only Jesus. That's all you need to know, only Jesus. We don't need to know everything. We make everything so complicated. How can I do this? How can I do that? What about this ministry program? What about that thing? What, are, what is everybody doing? What are we all going to, let's strategize with all the things. And let's, oh, and this person, and the, oh. <laughs> I get so sick of it. <laughs> you know, and this ministry is doing this program. And that ministry is doing that program. But they don't like each other. So I can't, if I do this ministry thing, they will be upset with me. And then I've got, what about, and they ask me, what are you, what is your big program? What, tell me your strategies. And I'm like, uh, Jesus. Because <laughs> they're so clever and I'm not. And they're like, I have the, and the PowerPoints and the things and all the wonderful, like, did, 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 all these amazing. And, and what do you do, Ros? And I'm like, oh, I just love Jesus. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, do. <laughs> so I was in a meeting just a few days ago or a couple of weeks ago it was. And they're going around, the, they're all ministers, and they're going around in a circle, all explaining what they do. And it was so impressive. I was like, wow. They're all, I've done this and that, and I've got this program, I've got that thing, and this amazing revelation, and oh, well, I've done this, and I'm, and I'm sitting there like, wow, I'm so impressed. I really am, like I'm not being, I'm not mocking. I really was impressed. I'm like, oh. Wow. And then they got to me and they're like, Rose, tell us what you do. And I'm like, I'm, I just die. <laughs> That's all I said. <laughs> Everyone just stopped and like, okay, moving on. Because <laughs> God's really taking me on this journey. Of I'm crucified with Christ. Like, I'm just dead. It's just Jesus. It's only about Jesus. Got nothing to do with me. Everything is dying. I'm just dying. I'm dead. I'm on a journey of dying. And Jesus is Lord. And he's taking over. That's all it is. You take over. I'll die. And you take over. And so that's what I told them. I'm like, I just, I'm just dying. <laughs> Oh, yes. So, yeah, I was going to tell it very quickly. It's like, don't look at the clock, anybody. So, <laughs> we can worship all day. You know, in Africa, church goes all day. You, Sunday is church day. So, you spend the whole day at church. Praise God. <laughs> and you're an African, so I can do that here. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love it. I love coming to this church. <laughs> When that's an Australian pastor, though, <laughs> Jimmy's just like smiling. I praise the Lord. Let's go. <laughs> the Australian pastor's like, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> so, when we were in Africa in this last trip a couple of months ago, we had a like our itinerary set. We had a bunch of places we had to go visit, a bunch, bunch of ministry bases. The Iris have ministry bases throughout Mozambique, and we we're going to visit them all. And um, and we, I made this plan. We had a team with us. I said, let's go into Mozambique. We had a car. Let's drive in through Kruger National Park. And it's like four-wheel drive off-road through all the safari with all the lions and the elephants and everything. I'm like, this will be fun. Let's, let's take our, these people have never been to Africa before. I'm like, let's take them on a real African adventure. And so I'm like, we'll go into Mozambique through Kruger, and then we'll come back out through the National Highway. When we're finished, we'll be tired after. After a few weeks, we we'll drive straight out. And uh, I booked accommodation up there in Mozambique near the park so we could stay there overnight. And then God spoke to me and said, swap it. 
He said, go in via the highway and come out through the national park. And I'm like, oh, but why? You know, there's no reason why. And I've already booked the accommodation. And God says, just do as you're told. You know, just listen and obey. Listen and obey. That's all you need to do, Ross. Simple. Listen, obey. Okay. Yes, Lord. So I called the accommodation. I said, can we swap the dates? And they said, yeah, it's no problem. That's fine. So we go into Mozambique. We spend three weeks. We're doing all our things, all wonderful ministry. We're seeing amazing things things happen. We're praying for lots of people. And, and it was amazing. And I'm still wondering, why did you make us swap it, God? It makes no sense. Now we're tired. Now we have to drive through the National Park. It's, you can only drive 40 kilometers an hour, although in, they do drive 70. But <laughs> the speed limit says 40 because of the big animals. You don't want to run into an elephant doing 70 kilometers an hour. <laughs> And uh, so I'm like, we're tired now. We've got to go through this off-road. Why, God? And I get this message from a Mozambican man. When we had lockdowns in Africa during COVID, Ash and I were running a live Bible study on Facebook every once a week or something, and um, twice a week. And this Mozambican man started watching. And we'd never met him, but he... He was watching online and he sent us messages. He even sent us some money once to support what we're doing, which is amazing. And um, he, so we got to know him online. So he sends me this message. He says, I hear you're in Mozambique. Can you please come to our village and preach the gospel? We have no churches here and in my village and in our neighboring village. And God has been putting it on my heart so much to go and preach the gospel. Would you please come? And I said to him, well, we're like our itinerary is full and and I knew that his village is like way out in the bush. I mean, you got to drive a couple of days, you know, it's like way out. And uh, I said, I don't think we can make it, but we're praying for you. And I said, well, just tell me exactly where your village is. So he tells me exactly where his village is. It's on the road that we have to take back out of Mozambique. <laughs> I'm like, we are literally going to drive through your village to come out of Mozambique. I said, if God hadn't told me to swap it, then we would have missed that opportunity. I said, we're coming. I said, God, this is God. God is all over this. It's God's will and desire that we come to your village. He has heard your prayers. You've been praying and crying out to God. He has heard you and he's answered you. And we are coming. I said, we're going to stay for three days in your village. And so we came to his village out in the bush. We had our little tents and we set up our tents in his backyard. And he's, he fed us. I mean, <laughs> he's this little mud hut and we're there and he's feeding us three times a day, like chicken and fish and, and shima and rice. And just, oh, I ate so much. I was so full. And you can't say no. You know, they just, here's some more food, some more. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> But we preached the gospel there, and we saw so many miracles. We went to the neighboring village that has zero churches, not even a Catholic church in there, is totally unreached. And Ash, was, Ash told one of our teammates, go and invite that man over there to come, and because we were under the mango tree preaching. He said, go invite him to come over. And our team member thought that Ash was pointing at the school. <laughs> so he goes over to the school and speaks to one of the teachers, and he says, well, you know, we have an outreach here. You can come and listen. And the teacher said, oh, I'm working. I'm at the school. I'm a teacher. I can't come over. So he says, okay. And about five minutes later, we're preaching and singing, and the whole school, all the students, all the children, all the teachers, the principal, everyone, they line up and they come walking out of the school and come and sit with us to hear the gospel. They shut down the school to come and hear the gospel. We're preaching and we gave them up. We went quickly to the market and bought lollipops for all the children. And we did a drama about the Good Samaritan. And we had the most amazing day with them. And every single one of them gave their heart to Jesus. The whole school, the teachers, the principal was crying like the glory of God just descended. And we planted a church there, first church in that village. And we planted a church in um, Daniel's home village as well in his house. And he's sending me messages just a couple of days ago with photos. He said, my house is overflowing. We need a building. We need a place because the fire of God is just descending. So we're going to try and go back there while we're there next week as well and encourage encourage them and bring them Bibles. They need Bibles and, um, and pray for them. So 
When you know God, when you listen to him, when you spend your life just listening and just doing what he says and knowing him and loving him, miracles happen. Miracles. And the miracle's not the point. He is the point. Jesus is it all. But they happen. And then other people get to know him. And that's the point. That's what it's all about. It's about Jesus. It's about making him known. It's about glorifying Jesus in the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we say here we are today. We say we want to know you, God. We want to know you more and more. Teach us your ways so that we may know you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know you, who's never met you, who's never had an encounter with you, I pray, Jesus, as you're knocking on the door of their heart, that they would open to you and they would let you come in and that you would sup with them, Lord God. I pray that they would know you. I pray everybody in this room would know you, that we would all go deeper and deeper and deeper in the knowledge of God. Lord, I pray as Paul prayed for the church, that we would be able to comprehend together with all the saints what is the height and the depth and the breadth and the length and to know the love of God in Christ Jesus so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, I pray the spirit of the living God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation would fill us, Lord. The eyes of our understanding would be opened, would be enlightened so that we would know you, so that we would know the hope of your calling, so that we would know the glorious riches of the, our inheritance in the saints, and we would know the exceeding greatness of your power towards us as we believe in you, Jesus. That same power that you wrought in Christ when you raised him up from the dead and you set him at your own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And you have made Jesus to be the head over his body, the church the fullness of him who fills all in all. Lord, I pray that we would know you. I pray that we would know that we are seated together with you in the heavenly places. I pray that we would know that you love us and that that love would cast out all fear, that we would be able to walk with you and we'd be able to make you known in this earth, that we would make the demons tremble because we walk with our God. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So good. So good. Come on. God bless you. So good. Can we have the musicians up here? That would be great. Fantastic. Can we appreciate them once again? Amen. Amen.